Welcome, one and all, to this timely and very important conference focusing on the future of intercollegiate athletics. Gonzaga Law School's Center for Law, Ethics, and Commerce and the University of Washington's Center for Leadership and Athletics are so pleased to partner together to host this event. My name is Jacob Rooksby, and it is my honor to serve as Dean of Gonzaga Law School. Gonzaga Law and UW are partners in several strategic endeavors, but we felt it important to tackle the issues we'll be discussing over the next two days in order to get ahead of the ever-changing landscape of intercollegiate athletics. Ours are two institutions with rich athletic programs that enjoy national brands and stand for athletics done right. We believe we can make a difference and take a leadership role in helping to shape the tone and quality of policy conversations across the sector. We intend to make a summit of this kind a biannual or even annual occurrence. While we had hoped to host this conference in person, we are pleased nonetheless to welcome attendees from all over the country. I know we have with us today university administrators, undergraduate and graduate students, coaches, conference commissioners and staff, alumni of our institutions, journalists, former athletes, general educational practitioners, faculty, sports enthusiasts, and other distinguished guests. Our panelists bring to us a wealth of experience from academic and athletic administration to faculty leadership to general intercollegiate athletics expertise. And several are themselves former collegiate student athletes. Our speakers, including keynote addresses on the front and back end, will challenge us to think deeply and broadly about the legal, leadership, educational, and ethical issues surrounding intercollegiate athletics and student athletes, and how these issues often intersect. It is my hope that we spend the next two days in true Jesuit fashion, searching for the truth so we can better understand the impact of policy and legal decisions that have been and are being made in this arena. For us to have a healthy, sustainable, and robust intercollegiate athletics environment, it is time to lead differently. It is time for our decision makers to take stock of the changing landscape in order to make decisions that truly reflect how we wish intercollegiate athletics to be, not just for our institutions, fans, and alumni, but most importantly, for our students. I'm excited to watch the sessions unfold. Please know how much we appreciate your time and attention over the next two days. While we would, of course, prefer to do this in person, we are excited for this opportunity to come together virtually and look forward to your participation and engagement with our speakers. It is now my honor to turn it over to our great partner from the University of Washington and my friend and colleague, Dr. Jen Hoffman, who has been instrumental in planning what promises to be a terrific event. Take it away, Jen. Thank you, Professor Rooksby. It is my absolute pleasure um, to welcome everyone joining us virtually today and to welcome our panelists and speakers. Um, my name is Jennifer Hoffman and I am an associate professor with the Center for Leadership in Athletics in the College of Education at the University of Washington. We are in a moment of incredible complexity and urgency in the landscape of intercollegiate athletics. I am grateful for the opportunity to join colleagues at Gonzaga University in presenting this forum with the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. The Future of College Sports Forum will be presented over two days. We begin with a keynote address by Michael McCann, founding director of the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute and professor of law at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Our first panel on legal perspectives will begin immediately after. This panel will be followed by a short break before the practical approaches to leadership panel. Throughout the forum, you can post your questions to the Q&A area of Zoom. We will forward your questions to the panel on your behalf. Our agenda is posted on the forum website where all times are listed in the Pacific time zone. We have also posted some additional resources on the forum website that offer a short summary of state NIL legislation, the NCAA versus Alston case, and the proposed federal legislation on college athletics. We will direct you to those resources as the Legal Perspectives panel takes up these topics. 
Finally, we invite you to connect with us over social media with the Twitter handles at Gonzaga Law, at Knight Athletics, and at UWCLA. And we will be using the hashtag, the future of college sports. In a few moments, we will introduce Michael McCann to offer our first keynote address. Good morning, Michael McCann. I am very pleased to welcome you today to the Future of College Sports Forum and have you offer our opening keynote address. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Th thank you so much for having me and the Dean, uh, Dean Rooksbury. Uh, I'd like to thank him and, and you, Jennifer, for bringing me on for this event. And I'd like to thank the many who are responsible for helping making the event possible. The University of Washington Center for Leadership and Athletics, Gonzaga University School of Laws, Center for Law, Ethics and Commerce, and the Knight Commission, of course. So I appreciate you all giving me a few minutes to talk in, for, for a topic that certainly deserves many minutes and will be talked about over the next couple of days. I don't think it's possible to have a better time to have an event called The Future of College Sports, examining legal issues today for the leadership of college sports tomorrow than right now. The future isn't right now at this moment, but it's close. It's not far off. In fact, it might arrive in a matter of days and certainly not past five weeks, about 35 days. You do the math, 35 days gets you to July 1, which is a crucial date in the future of college sports. The timeline over the next month is uncertain. It depends on which, if any, actions the NCAA takes in June, what Congress might do in that month, and rulings and potential rulings by the United States Supreme Court and other courts should they get involved. In a typical year, June is a very busy month for college administrators, including athletic departments. The academic year comes to a close. There are budgetary issues that have to be worked out. Budgets have to be proposed and approved. But busy won't be the right word this time around. Let's talk about what we know. We know that on July 1, the situation on the ground will change, dramatically so. At least six states, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Maryland will have NIL, name, image, and likeness statutes that go into effect on that day. While those statutes vary in certain ways, they all land in the same basic place. Going forward, colleges will be able, will be barred from denying their students who play sports opportunities to gain compensation from the use of their NIL. It will be illegal in many instances for schools to take adverse actions against those athletes, like pulling a scholarship or rendering them ineligible on the mere basis of capitalizing from NIL. And by taking advantage or capitalizing on NIL, I mean an athlete signing an endorsement deal or sponsoring a camp back home or being paid to sign autographs at a collectible show or receiving compensation to market good on Instagram or some other social media. And athletes will be able to hire agents as well, if they so wish, to help them secure deals through uh, various opportunities that might come their way. Now, how many college athletes will actually sign endorsement deals and from which sports will they play remains to be seen. There are pro athletes, including in the major leagues, that don't have endorsement deals. It's not as if every successful athlete in a particular sport automatically gets an endorsement deal. Actually, not many do if you look at the data. You have to be very marketable in a meaningful way to attract endorsement opportunities. But even among college athletes that aren't recruited for endorsements, they might still have other opportunities to take advantage of name, image, and likeness, 
like being paid to sponsor a camp, as I mentioned, or being paid to post things on Instagram. You don't have to sign a contract with Nike to benefit from NIL. To that point, there's an assumption that the beneficiaries of NIL will mainly be football players and men's basketball players, leaving many women athletes without equal opportunities. We'll see how accurately that assumption proves to be. Although I think it's interesting to note that this year, eight of the 10 most followed NCAA elite basketball players in this year's tournaments were women, not men. Now, whether that is indicative of a broader point remains to be seen, but certainly in terms of social media influencing, it might not just be football players and men's basketball players, it might be a far more diverse group. And some schools in states with NIL laws are already taking advantage of the forthcoming legal changes. Some have hired advising services to help them navigate through this. They see the writing on the wall and rather than running away from it, they're choosing to embrace it. And chances are they'll have a decisive recruiting advantage, at least in the short term. Come and play at Miami, the hurricane coaches uh, might say, or come to Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, Maryland. At those schools, starting July 1, unless there's a change, athletes will be able to sign endorsement deals with third parties. But if they go play at other schools, rival schools in other states, they can't, at least for now. Now, there are strings attached, to be sure. It's not going to be an open market for NIL. Under these same state statutes, athletes won't be able to enter into contracts that conflict with those signed by their school or their athletic department. So a player at a school sponsored by Nike won't be signing a deal with Under Armour. Compensation must also be commensurate with market value of an athlete's NIL, a qualification that seems designed to limit opportunities for boosters to cloak NIL payments as pay for play. The mechanics of determining market value certainly remain to be seen and could trigger litigation of their own. Meanwhile, NIL compensation can't be paid in exchange for athletic performance or attendance at a college. Payment can only be made by a third party unaffiliated with the college. So there are a number of, of boundaries and some are industry specific. In Alabama, for instance, their NIL law will forbid endorsement deals for tobacco products, casinos, and adult entertainment. But don't let those details distract you from the big picture. These new state NIL laws will unambiguously contradict NCAA amateurism rules, and really the broader concept of amateurism, which as we know, has long been a hallmark of college sports. Keep in mind that as of today, May 25th, college athletes are prohibited from receiving payments or their equivalents like gifts for their labor, for their NIL, or really for anything else. And the NCAA's position is captured in the concept of amateurism, which as we know, reflects a group of policies that by forbidding college athletes from receiving compensation outside of their grant and aid is designed to distinguish college athletes from professional athletes. The concept, it's been argued, is considered essential to NCAA sports. Without it, some fear, fans and consumers would regard NCAA sports and their athletes as a glorified minor league. The unique character of college sports could be lost. People would tune out. There may be some truth to that. We're, we're nostalgic by nature. We, we yearn for the past. We romanticize earlier times. I think we've all been doing that during the pandemic, maybe at a higher level than ever. Some who are on my generation, Generation X or older generations, remember college sports before the games were broadcast on multiple cable TV channels and conference networks. There were no conference networks. Before there were video games with college athletes in them. Before coaches made millions of dollars. And we don't need to look backwards for that point either. Many of us teach at institutions where the students who play athletics are genuinely students first. Although I teach at a law school, almost every year I teach one undergraduate course. And in it are plenty of students who play sports of various types. They aren't turning pro. Scouts don't go to their games. Their parents do and their friends do, but boosters aren't sitting nearby. They're students, they're student athletes, to use the term. 
and they're not gonna land endorsement deals if we're being honest. Now, will the possibility of being paid to sponsor a camp over a summer where they might get $500 to have their name attached to it, is that gonna change the character of their relationship to the university? Will that really make them pros in any logical sense of the word? Well, so far, NCAA rules won't allow that. College athletes are denied opportunities to receive more than the value of their athletic scholarships, which as we know, cover tuition, fees, room board, course related books and other expenses. College athletes can also receive several thousand dollars a year to reflect the full cost of attendance, but NIL is not allowed. So what's gonna happen between now and July 1 in terms of NIL law? I think there are several possibilities. One is that the NCAA seeks court orders in joining NIL state statutes from taking effect. I don't think I'm editorializing or necessarily being critical when I say that the NCAA is litigious by nature. I'm a lawyer, so that's not really a bad thing. Uh, but maybe to a fault, it doesn't back down. And if that proves true here, before July 1, we could see the NCAA petition courts for orders that would prevent or at least delay states NIL statutes from going into effect on July 1. The NCAA could name relevant state governors as defendants and pursue litigation in federal court. That's not a new strategy, not new for the NCAA either. The NCAA tried it nearly 30 years ago and it worked, albeit on a smaller scale. Some of you may remember the UNLV men's basketball scandal. It involved recruiting violations and the NCAA punishing UNLV and coach Jerry Tarkanian, who believed he was treated unfairly. There's a long, elaborate history to that that I, I won't get into. Well, the state of Nevada responded to that perception by passing a statute that guaranteed college coaches and players would receive due process protections, including the right to an impartial hearing officer. That was in direct conflict with NCAA rules, specifically from the Committee on Infractions, an entity that's not independent or neutral, and that isn't obligated to adhere to what we would consider to be constitutional due process. The NCAA sued Nevada Governor Robert Miller and won both at the district court level and before the Ninth Circuit. It maintained that there were two constitutional provisions that were violated. The first was the contract clause, Article 1, uh, Section 10. It instructs that no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. The NCAA said, look, Nevada's statute impairs our contractual relations with member schools in the state. Those schools are contractually bound as NCAA members to follow NCAA rules. The district court wrote that the NCAA would be impeded in fostering fair play if it, forced to, if it was forced to follow Nevada's statute. The second clause was the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, which, as we know, grants Congress the exclusive authority to regulate interstate commerce. Over the years, there's a corollary of the Commerce Clause known as the Dormant Commerce Clause. It instructs that states are forbidden from enacting economic laws that unduly burden the economies of other states. Nevada's statute, the court, courts plural found, effectively forced the NCAA as a national governing body to apply Nevada's statutes in 50 states, thereby impacting the commerce of those states. The, patch, the so called patchwork problem was also raised. Even if the NCAA have adopted Nevada's rule, what's to say other states won't come up with their own and say they conflict with Nevada's? How does the NCAA expect it to be uh, in a position to rec reconcile that? It's not beyond the realm of possibility that the NCAA now argues analogous contracts clause and commerce clause arguments against NIL statutes. Maybe those statutes interfere with the contractual relationship between the NCAA and member schools by forcing them to violate NCAA rules. And maybe the NCAA can't function as a national organization unless it adopts one state's NIL rules, but that creates a patchwork problem. Say another state comes up with something else. Of course, there are rebuttals. NIL is not about the relationship between schools and the NCAA, 
It's about the relationship between athletes and third parties, including sponsors. And I, NIL isn't about procedural safeguards, as was true in the Miller case. And the logistics of this possible strategy are daunting. The NCAA would presumably need to seek and obtain restraining orders in all of these NIL states. If they lose one, the strategy would seem to collapse because then there would be NIL in one state. I don't know about the merits of that idea. Another possibility is that schools in NIL states start to adopt the rules because they're forced to under state law and then other state schools do the same. It would seem logical to do so, you might say, since schools in non-NIL states are gonna be at a recruiting disadvantage come July 1. But if they do that, there's some risk. The schools would be breaching their membership contracts to the NCAA. The NCAA might reason that while schools in NIL states have no choice but to follow state law, schools in other states do have a choice. They're not compelled under state law. And the element of choice could take on legal significance. It goes to willfulness of conduct. And that actually came up in the Miller case. The court noted that member schools have contractually agreed to follow the NCAA's conditions and obligations of membership. Could the NCAA sue them for breach or for tortious interference? Maybe we'll find out. Still another possibility is that Congress and President Biden signs a federal NIL bill into law. And that's certainly possible in the sense that there have been about 10 NIL bills introduced over the last couple of years in Congress. Both Republican and Democratic members have introduced them. Some of the bills are focused exclusively on NIL, while others propose more transformative changes, such as revenue sharing and medical trust funds. The NIL piece would create a national NIL standard so that no state has a recruiting advantage. And so a uniform rule could apply. So that eliminates the patchwork problem that I just referenced. It ensures uniformity. I think many schools would prefer this be the case rather than schools in Florida get an advantage over schools in North Carolina. I mean, you can play that game all day. Why not just have one rule? But there are some reasons to be skeptical. First of all, it's May 25th. And the state laws go into effect on July 1. As of today, all of these NIL bills in Congress are still with their committee. There have been no votes and there have been no hearings. There have been plenty of news articles and plenty of tweets to be sure, but in terms of legislative advancement, it hasn't happened. And look, there's other, there are other things going on. I, I get that. Uh, you know, the world is a lot more complicated and seems to get more complicated every day and members of Congress are needed to address other more profound topics. But these bills have been percolating in Congress for two years and there hasn't been legislative traction. So maybe at the last second, they get things together, but you know, we're, it's May 25th and this has been going on a while. But even a federal bill wouldn't necessarily address all of the issues. What happens if a federal NIL bill nullifies or preempts a state NIL statute? Well, that could spawn its own legal challenges, as we know, when federal law interferes with state law. States could challenge the federal government taking a position on NIL, especially if a federal NIL bill conflicts with states. Uh, so as a law professor, it could be really interesting to study. I think for schools, it might be a little bit more disruptive. It's also possible that the NCAA tries to resolve the NIL quandary by doing what it signaled it would do in January, announce NIL guidelines that would apply across the board. Now, the NCAA punted back then, ostensibly because it was warned by the Department of Justice that NIL restrictions must comply with antitrust law. Now, whether, whether that warning should have pushed the NCAA to have to punt, I think can be, can be questioned. The, the need for rules to comply with antitrust law is not exactly a revelation. Uh, this is something that I assume the NCAA knew about before getting a memo from the Justice Department. Further, 
reasonable guidelines would satisfy NIL scrutiny. Just being susceptible to antitrust law doesn't mean that one has violated antitrust law. Maybe the NCAA next month, as it's been reported is possible, will announce NIL guidelines that would generally allow for college athletes to profit from NIL. There might be so-called guardrails or limitations attached. Maybe the guidelines wouldn't take effect until 22, 23 academic year, giving compliance folks much needed time to adjust. But this possibility, NCAA action in June, doesn't necessarily close the loop. Any NCAA guidelines might violate NIL statutes. Would the NCAA go to court? Would athletes in NIL states argue that they can benefit from maybe more generous statutes uh, over NCAA rules? It's all possible. As if the legal situation for college sports wasn't disruptive enough, there's also a US Supreme Court ruling that could arrive in a matter of days or weeks and certainly by July. It's the NCAA versus Alston case. In March, the nine justices heard an oral argument in a case that involves a different area of law than NIL, it's antitrust law. And it concerns the legality of colleges through the NCAA agreeing to limit compensation to student athletes. Generally speaking, antitrust law prohibits competing businesses from unreasonably restraining how they compete. The basic rationale is that when competitors work together, some element of the economy might experience higher prices or fewer choices or diminished innovation. Here, the argument is that it's illegal for the NCAA and its member schools, which are competing businesses, to cap grants and aid to tuition, fees, room, board, books, and other expenses up to the full cost of attendance. In a more competitive landscape, the plaintiffs have argued, schools would vie for recruits much like they contend for coaches or faculty or staff or prospective and admitted students or grants or fundraising or media attention or facilities. The list goes on. And think about it, when colleges battle to hire a top football coach, theoretically they can offer to pay that coach any amount of salary and any free fringe benefits. But with athletes, schools are capped. And that cap is because they've agreed as competitors to the cap. The athletes in this case have argued that this leads to schools spending money on persons and things around the recruit, but not the recruit himself or herself. It's like an orbit effect. You can't pay the recruit, so you pay the coach. Then you pay the trainer, then you buy a better facility, and so on and so on. Now, the NCAA has offered a series of defenses in this case. It's invoked language, some would say mere dicta, from a 1984 Supreme Court case and a trust ruling called NCAA versus Board of Regents, where although the NCAA lost in terms of its restrictions on TV broadcast, Justice John Paul Stevens urged the court to review NCAA rules with deference under antitrust law. And the NCAA frequently cites that package, pa passage, excuse me. The NCAA also maintains that grant and aid rules enhance competitiveness by, among other things, helping to distinguish college athletes from pro sports, particularly minor league athletes. And without that distinction, it's thought that college sports would be less marketable. That may be true promoting competitive balance in college sports, which the NCAA has said would be jeopardized if schools were wage bidding wars for athletes, and enhancing schools' ability to integrate academic and athletic goals and thereby promote education. How persuasive those reasons are can be debated. I'm not sure if a college athlete sponsoring a camp or being paid to influence on Instagram really transforms them into a minor league athlete, but it can be debated. They would be able to do things that their classmates could do and that doesn't cause their classmates to lose a scholarship. You can be a college student and be paid to influence and not lose your academic scholarship. 
Uh, and when John Mayer was at the Berkeley School of Music, signing a record deal didn't change his relationship uh, to the school. And when child actors earn money, they can still go to school and take advantage of school resources and scholarships and financial aid. As to competitive balance, one could argue there isn't competitive balance already. Every year, more or less the same group of schools are competing in the big games. And a lot of schools don't. Now there are exceptions and there are Cinderella stories. It's not a bright line thing, but the idea that there's competitive balance I think could be a question. As to integrating athletic, academics and athletics, would a college signing an endorsement deal interfere with his or her studies? They sign all sorts of things, including financial aid forms. They also take on a pretty heavy time burden to play a sport while studying a full load of classes, while many of their classmates can't work more than 15 or 20 hours per week. There are reasons to sort of question some of these reasons, but, but they're reasons. Well, last year, the Ninth Circuit ruled against the NCAA though limited the remedy to NCAA rules that restrict how schools reimburse and pay athletes for academic related expenses, like costs for computers and study abroad and internship opportunities. Those items are not multi-million dollar contracts for athletes, but they could still be worth a good amount of money. The Ninth Circuit though made clear that the NCAA could continue to limit how schools compensate their athletes in regard to athletics. But the ruling becomes precedent for others to rely on. There are all sorts of cases with attorneys who would vie for those cases that could be brought, including by high school athletes against NCAA rules and that would rely on this case as precedent. So the NCAA petitioned the Supreme Court to review the case and they did. They had oral argument in March and a ruling is expected most likely next month, but maybe in July. But the oral argument didn't seem to go all that well for the NCAA. Now we know it's a bit risky to extrapolate the tenor of questions during oral argument into a prediction on how judges will rule. That's a dangerous game, a gamble, if you will. But there was substantial hostility directed at the NCAA, particularly from the more conservative justices. Uh, maybe the NCAA expected that the conservative justices would be thinking, let's conservative, let's keep things the way they are. Well, conservative also means libertarian. Uh, the idea of joining hands and restricting competition. Justice Clarence Thomas wondered, why is it that amateurism only applies to the athlete? Is there a similar focus, he inquired, about coaches salaries that have ballooned, using his words. Justice Samuel Alito, drawing from some of the amicus briefs, wondered if athletes at powerhouse programs are quote, recruited, used up and cast aside. Just as Brett Kavanaugh bluntly charged that antitrust laws should not be a cover, I'm using his words, should not be a cover for exploitation of student athletes. He went on to say, schools are conspiring with competitors to pay no salaries to the workers who are making the schools billions of dollars on the theories that consumers want the schools to pay the workers not, nothing. That seems entirely circular and somewhat disturbing. Justice Amy Coney Barrett wondered if the definition of amateur is quote, simply someone who is not paid. She said, are you saying consumers love watching people playing, people unpaid people playing sports? So we'll see what happens. So where does that leave us? Well, in some form or another, major changes are coming to college sports. Not in five years, not next year. We're talking a matter of weeks, maybe even days. And when these changes come, the NCAA will need new rules. Not all new rules, most of the rules are fine, but they're gonna have to change some important rules. Compliance officers at schools will be in for some long nights and maybe there are some watching this now. I don't envy the work they have ahead. They're going to have to figure out what all of this means and what is their role. And they'll need to be mindful that there are other areas of law that pertain to all of these things. For instance, if schools provide some level of advice to athletes on matters pertaining to NIL, they better do so in a way that's consistent with Title IX and the need for gender equity. 
even reminding students that if they're paid, they're gonna to need to file taxes. And if they're independent contractors, which they'll probably be, they probably won't pay their taxes till the end. So they better save some money. That has to be done in an equitable way. All of the advice about NIL, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about over the next couple of days, has to be done in a way that's equitable. Now, this looming disruption, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean that in a factual sense, it wasn't necessary. This could have all been worked out years ago. I had the privilege of writing Ed O'Bannon's book, Court Justice. It was his case from 2009 that sparked the issues that I've been talking about and that are gonna be talked about over the next couple of days. He objected to college athletes' intellectual property appearing in video games without their consent or paying them. Had the NCAA changed its rules, schools wouldn't be on the cusp right now of facing what might be a sudden, sudden revolution in how things are done. Instead, the NCAA fought and lost the O'Bannon case. And this contributed to California becoming the first state to pass an NIL statute, the Fair Pay to Play Act, two years ago. Now, I realize when I say the NCAA, it's unfair to think it moves as one. It represents members, it represents conferences, and they all vote. It's not like the NFL or the NBA, where the commissioner and the owners can pivot pretty quickly, provided it's consistent with their labor agreement with their respective players associations. The NCAA is very diffuse. It's bureaucratic. I get that. But they've also had a dozen years. And at some point, things have to be done. And they didn't act. And now they're waiting for changes to be imposed. You know, you never know what kind of changes are going to come when you let others make those rules. Waiting for Congress to move on NIL has opened the door for far more transformative ideas to be offered in legislation, like revenue sharing and medical trust funds, whether they're good or bad. We, we can have that discussion over the next couple of days, but they're gonna be costly to schools in ways that maybe didn't have to occur for schools. The costs of waiting. Well, speaking of waiting, I think you've all been waiting to probably hear from somebody else that I've been talking for a long time. And what a conference we have ahead. I can't wait to listen and learn from the great panels. And thank you for having me. And thanks for listening in. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor McCann. That was fantastic. A wonderful setup for the rest of the forum, the wide range of issues from NIL to NCAA versus Alston to the proposed federal legislation. So thank you.